Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm not here with the guest directly. I've already recorded the interview, but I bring you an interview with Dr. Peter Singer. He is the Ira W. Dickham Professor of Bioethics at Princeton University and the Laureate Professor at the Center for Applied Philosophy and Public Ethics at the University of Melbourne. He specializes in applied ethics and approaches ethical issues from a secular, utilitarian perspective. He is known in particular for his book, Animal Liberation, in which he argues in favor of veganism, and his essay, Famine, Affluence and Morality, in which he argues in favor of donating to help the global poor. He has written, co-authored, edited or co-edited more than 50 books, including Practical Ethics, The Expanding Circle, Rethinking Life and Death, One World, The Ethics of What We Eat and The Point of View of the Universe. His writings have appeared in more than 25 languages. Uh, and so basically Dr. Singer came to Portugal and we met in Porto and we had the interview there and we talked a lot uh, about, uh, about a lot of different interesting subjects. Uh, we talked about the possibility of having um, moral objectivism or moral realism. Uh, I mean, and how we can do it. Uh, the limitations coming from evolutionary psychology and our evolved psychology. We talked about the limitations of reason. Uh, and then basically we also got into, of course, effective altruism, veganism, and some more specific topics like euthanasia and suicide. Uh, and we also talked a little bit about moral foundation theory and if it has any important implications for how people do moral philosophy in this case. So anyway, without any further ado, I bring you my interview with Dr. Peter Singer. Okay, guys, I'm here with Dr. Peter Singer in Porto. He has just participated in a conference at the Faculty of Arts of the University of Porto. And so we thought that it would be great to talk a little bit about ethics today, uh, as was the theme of the conference. Uh, namely, he gave a lecture that was titled Animals and Effective Altruism, two examples of the importance of applied ethics. So Dr. Singer, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show and it's a real pleasure to be here with you. Uh, thank you. I, I'm very happy to be here in Portugal and it's good to get a chance to do this in person. Yeah, it's great. It's my first time doing it in person, so let's see how it goes. Okay, so let's perhaps start with this. Since we're talking about ethics today, I guess that the first interesting question to ask is, is there any way for us to create or develop or to derive from any sort of source uh, an objective ethics or an object, uh, objective morality? I mean, is there any way for morality to be objective or do you think that uh, ultimately we would have to stick with moral relativism in some way? Uh, I'm not a moral relativist um, and I don't think we have to stick with that. Uh, I've shifted my views on this to some extent over the years. Uh, I was never, I never really called myself a relativist, but I did call myself a, a non-cognitivist, that is that there's no, nothing to be known about ethics. But um, in the last few years, uh, I've come to the view, influenced to some extent by Derek Parfit's work uh, on what matters, um, and also by the work of others like Tom Nagel, uh, I've come to the view that, that there is an objective basis for ethics, uh, and that basis is, uh, the self-evidence of some ethical claims. Uh, and I think the strongest and most significant one is one that was put forward by Henry Sidgwick in his great work, The Methods of Ethics, uh, when he said that from the point of view of the universe, the good of any one individual is as important as the good of others, assuming that there are similar amounts of good to be um, 
realized in each case. So basically what that means is that if I value my own good, my own happiness, for example, um, I'm not justified in saying that your happiness is less important than mine, or for that matter, the happiness of some stranger on the other side of the world. Just the fact that one is mine and the other is yours, or, or that third person, isn't really a an, an basis for saying that it's less important. Um, Sidgwick thought that's a, a rational insight, um, and on reflection, I agree with that. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I guess that because I've been having quite a lot of evolutionary psychologists on the show, I've been influenced by them in thinking about morality. Um, and the issue, I think, is that if we are to approach it from a purely evolutionary perspective, then we would be led, at least according to, for example, Stephen Hales that I had on the show recently, we would be led toward moral relativism because we have evolved conflicting moral systems or cognitive systems to deal with uh, moral information, let's say, or the ways we should interact with other people. Uh, and so some of them lead us toward preferring uh, an agent-centered morality, like, for example, kin selection, when we give preference to uh, people that are genetically related to us. Or, on the other hand, we also have other mechanisms, like, for example, reciprocal altruism, where we tend to perhaps develop a more agent-neutral morality, because we are more worried about reciprocating what other people give us, and perhaps if we think that our well-being is important, then we should extend it to, uh, we should extend that moral preoccupation, let's say, to virtually all people. And so, I mean, fr uh, strictly from an evolutionary perspective, it would seem to me that uh, because of these conflicting mechanisms, we wouldn't get to uh, moral realism or any kind of objective morality. What do you think about that? I think there's a serious mistake in what you said, and that is the idea that describing evolution and the evolution of our moral sentiments and moral judgments provides you with an answer to the question, is there an objective morality? Um, I can accept on the descriptive level everything that you said about how morality developed in different human beings, um, but I don't think that answers the question as to whether the understanding the evolutionary origins of our moral judgments um, tells us anything about whether there is an objective morality, right? Because it's it's one thing to say we have evolved in certain ways and we evolved moral judgments which help to ensure our survival, our ability to reproduce, the ability of our offspring to survive. All of that is true and it's interesting. I'm not saying it's not important, but it doesn't answer the question, um, is there or is there not some objective basis that for example, any rational being, whether they'd evolved on this planet or on some other planet in very different circumstances, would be able to see. Um, and I believe that the judgment that I mentioned before, that my interest is of no more importance than yours or that of some third person, is not a judgment that you would expect to have evolved in terms of enhancing the survival of our ancestors. Because clearly to say we should be neutral between the interests of our, ourselves and of our family and our kin and those with whom we're in reciprocal relations and the interests of strangers, that at, that at some level they count the same, um, is, is not a judgment that is going to benefit you or your offspring. On the contrary, it's likely to reduce your chance of survival. So you have to ask the question, how is it then that philosophers, people like Sidgwick, people like Parfit, myself, and I think many others, um, nevertheless can see this as something that is uh, an important 
claim, um, a defensible claim in ethics. Um, and I think the answer to that is that along with evolving particular moral sentiments, we also evolved a capacity to reason. Now, of course, the capacity to reason benefited ourselves and our offspring in terms of survival. Mm -hmm. But once we learn to reason, then I think we cannot avoid certain conclusions, just as once we start to develop arithmetic, eventually that will lead us to mathematical theorems that, you know, maybe in pure mathematics that have no real survival value. Mm -hmm. So I think once we develop the capacity to reason, then uh, that leads us to this perspective, the ability to take the point of view of the universe and to say, oh, now I can see that your interests matter to you just as much as my interests matter to me, even though you're not my kin, we're not really in a reciprocal relationship, and so on. So um, I think that is something that any rational being could come to see, uh, no matter what circumstances they evolved in. Mm -hmm. So about reason, and that's basically the thesis that you developed in the expanding circle, right? Um, and so about that, uh, I have one thing to say, that is I interviewed for the show Hugo Mercier that wrote a recent book with Dan Sperber, uh, The Enigma of Reason, where they talk about the, the argumentative theory of reason, as they call it. And they basically say, they present some evidence and some arguments, convincing evidence and arguments, of course, that uh, the reason why we evolved uh, reason uh, was to, for us to be able to convince other people uh, that we are right and others are wrong and to keep our social reputation and to win competition, social competitions uh, and to, yeah, b basically things like that. So, uh, I mean, what, what I'm trying to say here is that uh, I'm not completely sure that the way we use reason as an evolved mechanism uh, necessarily leads toward uh, the kind of morality that you are describing because it seems that intuitively people would use it to benefit themselves in some way and so not really in terms of creating some sort of uh, objective uh, agent neutral uh, approach to morality for example but rather to try to convince others that they are right and other people they are competing with with are wrong. And so maybe we could also use reason uh, to convince other people that to have a preference toward ourselves, our kin, our community, our country or whatever would be better than to extend those same uh, that same preoccupation toward the rest of humanity for example okay before i get into the substance of that let me just say you you mentioned that the view i put forward before uh, is in my book the expanding circle that's true but um you know, there's a more recent version of it uh, in a book uh, that i co-authored with katarzyna de lazari radek a mm -hmm. polish philosopher called The Point of View of the Universe. Okay. And I think uh, we go f a bit further there than I did in The Expanding Circle. Uh, secondly, regarding the thesis by uh, Messier and, and, and Sperber that you put forward, again, I, th I think it's a mistake to think that providing an explanation of the origins of reason, how we got to develop our ability to reason, mm -hmm. uh, whether their explanation is right or wrong, and I'm not sure about that, but it could be, uh, could be right, um, but that doesn't tell us whether reason leads to objective truths, right? It may be that there were various benefits in convincing others, um, and that's why we developed a, an ability to reason. I mean, it may also be that there, were, you know, we developed mathematics so that we could count the number of tigers that went into the bush, and uh, we know whether it's safe to go in or not by counting the number of tigers who came out. That's, that's been suggested, obviously, too simple an explanation. But, but that doesn't mean that reason is only useful for counting tigers or that reason is only useful for uh, 
uh, winning arguments, and it doesn't mean that everything that we do in terms of reasoning is necessarily going to benefit us. Um, and I would argue that the effective altruism movement that has developed in the last decade or so mm -hmm. shows that uh, there are people who are very willing to use their reason to reach the conclusion that they ought to be living altruistically at least or at least that altruism ought to be an important part of their lives um, even if they're not a hundred percent altruistic in everything they do and and that that has led them to do things that they would not have done otherwise so I think that suggests that once you develop reasoning to a certain ability it leads you into certain places that um, may not benefit you at all um, and maybe places that are actually taking you to what is an objective truth rather than uh, what is something that would benefit each one of us separately. Do you think that there's any way for us to derive uh, morality from facts or from scientific data? Uh, the short answer to that is no. Um, I think that facts and scientific data are very helpful in formulating um, if you like, lower level rules as to what will achieve the ultimate values that we decide are the things that we want to maximize. Um, or if you're not a consequentialist, I suppose you could say deciding what are the, the rules that we ought never to violate, although that's not my view. Um, but uh, I still think that uh, essentially David Hume was right when he said you can't derive uh, an ought from an is. Um, and I think to think that simply you know, scientific and empirical understanding of the world will tell us how we ought to live is a mistake. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, do you think that the only way for people to agree on some sort of objective morality is for them to agree on the same moral axioms and to accept them? Because this is one argument that people bring to the table whatever, whenever we're talking about objectivity or subjectivity in morality, that is, um, if we can't derive it from palpable things like facts, for example, if we can derive it from the way the world works, then we would be left with trying to convince everyone that the values that we hold uh, that they should also hold them or something like that. Do you agree with that approach? Or Yes, I suppose that's true. Um, I think if we were to get complete agreement on the fundamentals of ethics, it would require uh, convincing others that, well, firstly, that we ought to be consequentialists, that is, that we ought to maximize the good, um, and secondly, if we want to be, let's say, hedonistic utilitarians, that uh, there's only one way to understand the good, and that is in terms of maximizing pleasure and minimizing pain, um, you know, or whatever other values. If you're not a hedonistic utilitarian, but you're some other kind of consequentialist, you have to convince people that uh, whatever values you think ought to be maximized are the right values. Um, and that's not easy. That's uh, a difficult task. Um, it's a task that requires careful reflection requires, I think, trying to put aside certain distorting f factors, including some of the ones you mentioned about how some of our moral intuitions have evolved because they benefited uh, our ancestors and their offspring. Um, maybe it involves putting aside some cultural traditions. If you grow up in a Christian society, you might, for example, think that it's never justifiable intentionally to kill an innocent human being. Um, but again, I think philosophical reflection can show that uh, although that you know, would be very rare that that was justified, there could be circumstances in which that was the only way to prevent the killing of a very large number of innocent human beings uh, in which that would be the right thing to do. So you have to put aside those uh, sort of cu that cultural bias uh, as well. Um, and it's, it's, it's hard to do those things, but my view is that if you succeed in doing those things and then you are able to reflect on 
what is what what are the fundamental axioms of morality and what are the ultimate values um, you're likely to come up with something that is an objective truth so I guess this is a bold question but because we uh, philosophers over time have developed different systems of morality or ethical systems like for example I don't know virtue ethics Kantian ethics uh, Rawlsian contractarianism, utilitarianism, and all other sorts of ethical systems, that it could be the case that the reason behind that is that those different philosophers, uh, I mean, they feel uh, they are pulled toward a certain perspective on morality because of their own preferences because they have different personalities i mean just uh, this is just a, cu a cu uh, curiosity of mine but just the other day i was thinking about kent and he seemed to me to be a very conscientious person and that's why i, I was just wondering that perhaps he developed that ethical system uh, because he just wanted for people to follow the rules and that's it and don't think about uh, if people felt worse or, or better uh, due, due to following them i mean these are the rules just follow them <laughs> something like that of course i'm oversimplifying it but do you think that it, it could be the case that different philosophers and they argue with one another and ultimately perhaps they don't agree because it all stems from them having different prefer, uh, preferences and personalities uh yes it's possible that a, a a fair amount of the disagreement between philosophers stems from from different personalities but um, I'd like to suggest that a lot of the different ethical views that you mentioned, including, say, Kantianism and virtue ethics, and uh, they people support them because they are actually an important part of morality. But the mistake is to think that they are the ultimate values or goals of morality. Um, virtue ethics, for example. Uh, I think it's really important in educating children to bring them up as, as virtuous people, to uh, instill in them the idea that, that they have a certain nature uh, and that nature should be what is likely to lead them to act well in some of the many complicated and unpredictable circumstances in which they're going to find themselves. Um, you know, I was just at a, speaking at a conference about um, ethics and artificial intelligence in Dresden in, in Germany um, and you know in part of part of my talk I suggested that if you know I was uh, I was addressing the question can artificial intelligence be ethical and how can we do that and I was arguing that we can't do it by giving it rigid rules because there will be circumstances in which that could lead to catastrophe um, and it would be better if somehow you could uh, teach artificial intelligence how to be ethical by having it observe virtuous people. Uh, this obviously is something like what Aristotle said about how to bring up your children uh, to be virtuous by putting them in a virtuous society. Uh, so I think you know, virtue ethics definitely has a role, but on the other hand, it doesn't really tell you what is the right thing to do. It doesn't tell you, you know, when different virtues point in different directions, how do you resolve that? Um, whereas I think uh, a consequentialist view of value can tell you how to resolve that. It can say, well, maximize the values. But that doesn't mean that you want to just instill that rule into your children because it, you know, it's too difficult to follow, to work out. Similarly, you mentioned Kant and his uh, penchant for following rules, uh, which I think you're quite right. That was part of his personality. You know, apparently, um, his neighbors in Königsberg could set their clocks by the time when he went for his afternoon walk because right. he was so regular, so following the rule. Um, so uh, rules have this place in, again as, as guidance because it is too difficult usually to calculate the consequences of everything you do so it's very useful to have a set of rules about you know, telling the truth, don't uh, hurt others don't injure them, whatever um, but again they're not the full answer because there can be cases where rules clash where you have to work out you know very unusual circumstances where it might be 
the right thing to break even, as I said before, even such a fundamental rule as never kill an innocent human being. So, so the rules alone are not, not enough either. And it's because all of these pieces of the moral jigsaw can fit under the umbrella of utilitarianism that I think utilitarianism has the strongest credentials here. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, and through social psychology, for example, in cognitive psychology, we know that the ways our environments are structured influence people uh, toward preferring uh, certain kinds of behavior and acting toward other people uh, in certain ways. So do you think it is problematic if people that know better, scientists, for example, psychologists in this case, uh, would set environmental parameters to nudge people toward preferring the behaviors that we derive from an ethical system that we prefer, for example, utilitarianism. Do you think that would in some way be problematic to try to in, in some way rob them of their uh, free will or the ways by which if they follow their innate intuitions, let's say, they are led to behave toward other people. Do you think that that's in some way problematic or that would be a good thing to do? Uh, If we're talking about nudges here, then I think if the nudges are things like changing the defaults, um, I don't think it is problematic because there's always some default in, you know, when people are in a situation, there's always um, the status quo might there might be a bias to the status quo that might be the default um, but the status quo might not necessarily be the best thing but that might lead people to act on the status quo you know they uh, rather than to do something that would be the best thing so um, I think it's legitimate to change the defaults in a way that um, reduces some existing bias like the status quo bias um, but does not constrain them, right? If they still think that uh, the, the way uh, the, they're being nudged is not justifiable, they're perfectly free to change that. Just as if you had not set up the nudge and there was the status quo and, and the possibility of change, then they would be still free to abandon the status quo and change it. It's just that we know psycho- from psychological studies that people are more likely to stay with the status quo. So similarly, if we have the reverse of that situation where we know that setting up the nudges in a certain way makes people more likely to do the thing that's better, but they still could decide against that and decide for the status quo, I don't think that threatens their free will or autonomy any more than just walking into the situation as it is would threaten their free will or autonomy. But wouldn't that be problematic if uh, scientists know that changing this or that feature in the environment inevitably leads people toward behaving in a certain way? Because, I mean, we could get here into a discussion about if if free will really exists or not. But, uh, I mean, leaving that aside, if scientists know, okay, if we have this feature in the environment or if people are exposed to this sort of stimulus, then they, like, for example, 90% of the time, they will behave this way. Do you think that because uh, people that know better would be tweaking the environment with that knowledge in hand, that that could be problematic? Uh, Is 10% still choose the other way because they've thought about it and reflected on it and decided to go the other way. Uh, I don't think it's problematic. I mean, if somehow it were 100%, then you would really want to look at, uh, is there still a a choice possible here? But, um, you know, I mean, it might be that some of the defaults also lead to 90% accepting the the status quo or, you know, the way that things are presented, opting, opting, um, not opting, not opting in. Let's say we're talking about the the question about whether you'll allow your organs to be transplanted after you were brain dead in a car crash um and maybe you know 
fewer than 10% say yes to that when it's put that way. But on the other hand, if you say, are you going to opt out of, um, you know, we're, we have a system where everybody, everybody's organs are available to save the lives of others if they're brain dead, um, but you can opt out of that. Um, and that goes then 90% the other way. Uh, I can't see that that's any more of a threat to free will than the fact that 90% don't opt in uh, shows that they're not exercising their free will. Mm -hmm. Okay, so could you give us, because you've already touched a little bit on this, could you give us a brief overview of what uh, effective altruism is about? Sure. Um, effective altruism is a, a relatively new movement, uh, about a decade old, that um, has two elements, um, as you get from the two terms. Uh, the altruism, uh, effective altruists believe that altruism ought to be an important part of your life, that uh, you ought to think about making the world a better place, and that should be one of your goals, even if not your only goal. But the effective part of effective altruism, um, which is newer because, of course, altruism has been talked about for a long time, um, is that whatever resources you put towards making the world a better place, you should try to make the most effective use of those resources that you can. Uh, and that will mean, for example, if one of your resources is money and you want to donate it to an organization that's trying to make the world a better place, you ought to look at what evidence there is about which organization will be able to do the most good with your donation. Um, and the effective altruism movement has been involved in generating that evidence and getting independent studies of organizations to see how much good they do per dollar that they receive. Mm -hmm. But in evaluating those organizations, they take into account what are their goals, right? I mean, they're doing it by uh, evaluating if, for example, they are trying to fight malaria in Africa, to what extent the approaches that they apply are effective, right? Yes, certainly they will look at uh, to what extent the uh, approaches are effective if, if stopping malaria in Africa is their goal. On the other hand, if uh, let's say you have a foundation and its goal is to put on, I don't know, opera, um, you know, expensive production for people that gives them some pleasure, um, but effective altruists would be very likely to think, uh, however effective this organization is at using your funds to promote opera, it's not going to be comparable with saving the lives of children who would otherwise die of malaria um, or restoring eyesight in people who are blind because they have cataracts and so on. Um, these, are the, these, these things are going to outweigh some of the other things that you know, might be values. You might think, yeah, great, more opera is a good thing. But you effective altruists make judgments about which are the goals that are really going to do most to improve the world. So do effective altruists establish a sort of hierarchy of needs and they put some of them, they give priority to some of them and then, I mean, if those needs are met, then they think about moving up the scale and providing people with uh, a better quality of life and achieving other things besides the basic needs like for example water food shelter and things like that uh, yes I guess effective altruists have slightly you know different takes on this uh, some of them would talk about uh, extreme poverty and lifting people out of extreme poverty which might be a purely material kind of indicator, how much income do they have, or they might look at how well does the family eat, are they adequately nourished, can they afford some basic health care. Um, some effective altruists try to look at uh, indicators of subjective well-being, so how happy p are people, how satisfied with their lives, um, those things are also important. Um, but yeah, they would have a hierarchy and uh, you know, some look at mental health, um, there's in some interesting discussions now about how cheaply we can uh, improve mental health and how much suffering we can avoid there because depression in particular is a major cause of mm -hmm. suffering. Um, so, so they do look at those things and, and I suppose you could say yes, once they meet the basic survival needs, then they will look at things like well-being and mental health. Um, and some effective altruists actually are looking at very large issues like reducing the risk that we will become extinct through some mm -hmm. 
global catastrophe. Um, so there's a range of different things that effective altruists look at, but they all tend to be things that um, I suppose you can agree are, um, are values like reducing suffering, uh, people having worthwhile and fulfilling lives, mm -hmm. not having catastrophic consequences, uh, things like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, they care first if, if the basic necessities of life for people are met, and then, uh, because, I mean, perhaps I want to ask you if there would be virtually any limit to what we would demand from people in terms of them investing some money in aid, in foreign aid, for example, or giving some money to the poor. Uh, so uh, talking about the poor, of course, we're talking about people that haven't yet met these basic needs. But uh, if we move up the scale in terms of needs, would there vir uh, be virtually any limit as to what we should ask people to uh, to provide and to give for for other people to increase their well-being i mean if le let's say just for the sake of the argument here that everyone on the planet would have their basic needs met and they would have access to health care and to ed and to education and to jobs and things like that do you think that if there would still be resources left that we, sh we should try to provide them also with entertainment, for example, would that, uh, should people, should we ask people for that, for example? Uh, so I'm not sure whether you're asking um, what I think about that as a utilitarian or what effective altruists think about that, because not all effective altruists are utilitarians. Mm -hmm. um, so a utilitarian typically will think, um, <coughs> if you can do more good, let's say you know, you're comfortably off, uh, you have some money that you could spare, and that could do more good um, by giving it to some effective charity than by keeping it for yourself, mm -hmm. then a utilitarian would say that's what you ought to do. Um, and that the more good there would apply beyond basic needs. So if, for example, I actually know a utilitarian, um, uh, Richard Sikora, who once said to me many years ago, um, he donated to set up a uh, classical music FM radio station because he thought people can get a lot of pleasure from listening to good classical music and it's very cheap to broadcast it to a large audience. Um, so yeah, and you know that view, he would he would say we ought you know if if we've solved all of the other needs, um, and I th I think you know it wasn't the right thing to do because obviously we haven't solved all the other needs yet. Sure. But if we had solved all those other needs, and you could make people much happier by setting up a classical music uh, music radio station, now of course it would all be on the internet, so you don't really have to do that. But um, yeah, that would be the right thing to do too. But but. There might be effective altruists who are not utilitarians and who think that there's a kind of, you know, maybe they're sort of Rawlsians. There's a priority to helping the worst off. Mm -hmm. um, and once we've got the worst off, well, they might be like, you know, Harry Frankfurt had this sufficientarianism, as he called it. Once, once we get people to a sufficient level of sufficiency, mm -hmm. we don't have obligations to help them further. You could be an effective altruist on that basis as well. And then once we got to this level of sufficiency, you wouldn't have to do any more. Um, I should perhaps also mention, we've been talking about people, effective altruists wa also want to think that, uh, that they think that animal suffering counts, so if there's uh, a lot of animal suffering that you can uh, prevent, then that's also a good thing to do. Mm -hmm. We will get into veganism shortly, but just before we get into that, uh, I mean, we were talking about uh, effective altruists, talking about the utilitarians, uh, specifically, I mean, do you think that the limit to them would be to simply eliminate all sorts of pain and suffering in the world? Or do you think that you, even extreme utilitarians would take seriously the proposal that some people have that perhaps if we weren't to experience any sort of distress or pain or suffering, we wouldn't be able to appreciate the good things in, in life. And so 
we should be a bit careful about trying to eliminate all of the suffering that we have. Well, unfortunately, I don't think we have to be very careful about that at the moment because okay. I don't see any prospect of, of eliminating all the suffering we have. It's an interesting question whether if we did, then we also wouldn't value the good things um, and whether that would mean that it wasn't worth doing. I suppose, you know, it, it depends what you consider suffering here. Um, I mean, I, uh, if you think, for example, well, if I wasn't hungry, mm -hmm. I wouldn't enjoy my lunch. Um, but being hungry is a kind of suffering, then I suppose you wouldn't want to necessarily eliminate that. But, um, you know, fortunately, I'm not in any danger of not getting enough food. So I don't really regard the sort of feelings, oh, it would be nice to eat something that I might have for an hour or two before lunch as, as a kind of suffering, given that I know that I'm actually going to be able to get some lunch. So um, I think it does depend what you consider suffering to be. Mm -hmm. Right. So let's now get into veganism. Uh, you've been a bival veganism, right? For some <laughs> time. <laughs> okay, so uh, that's interesting because you exclude bivalves, right, from your ethics. Uh, what's the reason to that? I mean, what are the sort of criteria that you take into account in terms of the mental experiences that other beings, sentient beings in this case, have for you to include them in your moral circle? Right. Well, um, yeah, it's interesting because I guess veganism is, decided, is defined as avoiding uh, all animal products. Um, but my basis for supporting uh, veganism is uh, well, primarily because I want to avoid being complicit in inflicting suffering on animals. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the cutoff line for me is, is the question of, is this being capable of suffering? Um, and there's no a priori reason to expect that the division that biological scientists draw between animals and you know, plants, let's say, or, or other organisms, um, are, is the same as the division between beings who are capable of suffering and beings who are not capable of suffering. And I think a good example of how those divisions are not exactly the same uh, is the bivalves, the oysters and mussels and clams um, and so on. Um, these are definitely animals biologically, um, but uh, they have very simple nervous systems, not really centrally organized in a brain or anything like that. Um, they're not very mobile, so you know, the idea of developing a sense of pain so that you can run away from danger or the source of pain um, isn't really applicable to them. And for that reason, I think it's much more likely that Know, like plants, they do not have a capacity for feeling pain. So if that's so, then you know why shouldn't you eat them? Well, you, know, you might say possibly there could be environmental reasons. Sometimes some vegans certainly have good environmental reasons for not eating some animal products. But again, it doesn't seem that that really applies to bivalves. Although some methods of harvesting bivalves might be harmful for the ocean environment, um, others are not. And and uh, actually growing oysters as a sort of oyster farm is, is, you know, helps to clean the water because oysters filter um, pollutants out of the water. So I don't see a problem. It's not that I regularly eat them. I can't remember when I last ate an oyster or a mussel, actually. It's not that very recent. Um, but in theory, I, I certainly don't see any problem in doing that. So you're basically worried about suffering, right? But what would that imply in terms of uh, the sorts of um, mental mechanisms that the animal has to have in place? Would that uh, entail that uh, it would have to experience uh, emotions, it would have to experience pain, that it would have to have at least uh, some degree of uh, cons uh, conscious, uh, um, consciousness or... Uh, yes. What exactly? Yes, I think it's the latter, really. It uh, has to have some degree of consciousness to be able to experience pain. I think of pain as a, a, a state of consciousness. Um, and 
you know, then of course people ask, what is consciousness? So the, the standard definition is um, that there is something that it is like to be that thing. So in other words, if I see a, a, a hen in a, a small cage where she can't even stretch her wings um, and she seems to be under stress and perhaps getting pecked by other hens in the crowded cage, um, I think, well, there's something that it's like to be that hen. Um, that hen is having experiences, and those experiences are, are b undesirable ones, bad ones. Um, on the other hand, if I ask, is it something that it's like to be that oyster um, sticking to a rock there? Um, my guess is that there's nothing that it's like to be that oyster, that it's not conscious. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that you take consciousness into account because, I mean, later this year, I just got across this, but Peter Carruthers is going to publish a book titled uh, Human and Animal Minds, the Consciousness Questions Laid to Rest. And I'm going just to read a bit of the synopsis here because this is very interesting. Uh, Carruthers shows that there is actually no fact of the matter because thoughts about consciousness in other creatures require us to project our first person concepts into their minds. But such projections fail to result in determinate truth conditions when those minds are signi significantly unlike our own. This upshot, however, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter for science because no additional property enters the world as one transitions from creatures that are definitely incapable of phenomenal consciousness to those that, are, that definitely are, namely ourselves. And on many views, it doesn't matter for ethics either, since concern for animals can be grounded in sympathy, which requires only third-person understanding of the desires and emotions of the animals in question, rather than in first, uh, rather than in first, uh, in first-person empathy. Sorry. So, I, I guess that basically is saying that uh, even for us to take. Uh, other animals' experiences seriously uh, at an ethical level. I mean, that consciousness uh, isn't that important uh, because we can't really know what it is like for them to experience the world uh, at a mental level or something like that. Yeah, I'm, I'm, look, it's, it's, it's uh, risky to comment on a book from uh, you know, a few sentences uh, right. as abstract. Um, no, it, it's, not, it's not to comment on the book, but right. basically on the idea that I took from the synopsis. Because okay. Yes, okay, so clearly I disagree that uh, we don't need to know about consciousness to know which beings matter and how we should treat them. Uh, I think that's really important. Um, and, and my problem was I'm not sure that I understand exactly why Peter Carruthers thinks that it's not important. It, it seems to suggest almost that he's thinking it's something like which beings we have sympathy for matters. But, but if our sympathy is misplaced, um, then isn't, aren't we making a mistake? I mean, you know, there are these cases of people whose uh, loved ones have been uh, in a p persistent vegetative state, or maybe they've even been completely brain dead, mm -hmm. um, but they've not wanted the respirator's life support turned off because they've been under the impression that their loved one was still feeling something, was still reacting. Now, uh, let's assume that that is a mistake. Let's assume it's not one of these cases where the doctor's got it wrong, which is also possible, of course. Mm -hmm. But let's assume that that just is a mistake and there's nothing going on um, in the person's brain and there's uh, no conscious experiences. Then the fact that the person has sympathy with them doesn't seem to me to be a good justification for saying that, uh, well, we ought still to keep them on the machines because here's somebody who has sympathy with them. Um, so I think there's, it's really, it, it, it would be ethically important to know which beings are conscious and which are not. Um, to what extent that's possible, that's, that's certainly another question. And I agree that it's often very difficult to determine that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so perhaps still talking about effective altruism and utilitarianism, uh, what are your views on uh, improving um, on human enhancement I in terms, for example, of genetic engineering? Do you think that uh, if we were able to 
uh, pinpoint precisely the genes that uh, uh, that were behind the development of, for example, certain neural pathways that would make us experience uh, bad emotions, for example, or pain beyond a certain threshold that uh, we would also be morally obliged, uh, if we were certain of what we were doing, to tweak those sorts of systems to also improve people's lives in that way or not? Uh, yes, if we really were certain of what we were doing and uh, certain that it would have no um, unpredictable side effects, um, I think those could be good things to do. So, so you mentioned extreme pain. It, it does seem that um, although pain obviously has evolutionary value and um, people who have no sense of pain are likely to leave their fingers on a hot plate or something like that and suffer injury, um, there is a point at which uh, pain already has transmitted the warning signal um, but uh, and you've done whatever you can but it just goes on and gets worse and maybe gets gets really very bad um, and we might now take painkillers to relieve that but if uh, you could simply tweak some nerve so that pain could only get to a certain threshold at the, the threshold of usefulness and couldn't get beyond that threshold um, I think that would be a very good thing to do so uh, things like transhumanism in principle don't seem morally problematic to you I mean uh, proposals like we moving beyond uh, our human condition in a certain way and perhaps overcoming death uh, and things like that uh, yeah, again, under the condition that uh, we know what we're doing and we're not producing other negative consequences that come out of it, um, I don't have a problem with transhumanism. I don't think that um, the idea that somehow this is a constituent element of being a human being has um, normative weight. I think what we want to know is, is, is this a constituent element of having a worthwhile life, an enjoyable life, a fulfilling life, a rich life, what other terms you, you want to use. Um, but if we can have better lives by being less typical of members of the species Homo sapien as they've been up to this point, then that would be a good thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, to uh, talking again about uh, pain and bad emotional and mental experiences that people go through, uh, what is your take on things like euthanasia and suicide? Do you think that we should, uh, in principle, uh, provide people with the possibility of uh, requiring help to end their lives if they say or manifest in some convincing way uh, that they are going through uh, such an immense amount of pain and distress and suffering that for them their own lives are not worth living anymore. Yes, I think that people should have that uh, ability to request and receive assistance in dying if their lives have, if the quality of their lives has fallen to a point that they find unbearable, that they don't want to go on living. And if there's no prospect of that changing, uh, I think they should be able to get assistance in dying. Um, and I'm very pleased that this movement clearly has been spreading uh, around the world in the last couple of decades, um, particularly in Canada now recognizes this, um, the west coast of the United States, uh, Oregon, Washington, California, those states all recognize it, uh, a number of other states as well. Um, of course, in Europe it's been for a long time possible, in the Netherlands and in Belgium and Luxembourg, also in Switzerland. Uh, and uh, I'm pleased to say that just four days ago it became legal in uh, my home state, the, the state that I come from, uh, which is the state of Victoria in Australia. Mm -hmm. It's the first Australian state, although the Northern Territory legalised that some years ago. Uh, it, the Northern Territory is a territory, not a state, and that was overruled by the Federal Parliament. But because Victoria is a state, the Federal Parliament can't overrule that. Uh, so it is now established in uh, one part of Australia anyway. Mm -hmm.
And do you take seriously the arguments that some people put on the table when they're talking about euthanasia, for example, uh, when they say that, um, since we're talking about suffering, of course, that we, we should also take into account the way by which someone choosing to die might affect people that are emotionally connected to him or her? Uh, if you're saying, should we take that into account, or should the person requesting the assistance take that into account, then yes, ethically they should, because ethically, really for all our choices, we ought to take account of the effect that we're having on others. But if you're asking a question about, should that be part of the law, um, I would say no. I think in, in legal terms, it's the individual who is suffering who ought to have the right to make the request and to receive the assistance. And I don't think uh, the doctor or some other committee should say, no, even though you're suffering, if I help you to die, that will cause great distress to somebody else, and so I'm not going to do it. Because I don't think anyone else is really in the position to put themselves uh, in the position of the person who is requesting assistance in dying um, and to know how much they're suffering. Um, and I think, therefore, you have to leave it to them to judge how important the suffering of others who are close to them might be as compared with their own suffering. Mm -hmm. uh, have you been taking seriously the work done by moral psychologists like Jonathan Hyde and the moral foundations like care, harm, fairness, uh, loyalty to the group, respect for authority, and purity, sanctity? I mean, uh, knowing that basically or virtually all human beings have those five basic moral foundations and that in different societies perhaps people give different weights to each of them and maybe for example liberals prefer to put more weight into uh, things like care arm and fairness and conservatives give equal weight, I guess, to the five moral foundations, and then we get into libertarians that basically only care about liberty. Uh, do you think that that should influence in any way how people do moral philosophy to know about that or, or not? I don't think it really should greatly influence moral philosophy. Maybe you know, it should interest. It should in influence public policy because uh, you, if you, if moral philosophy sets out the, you know, you come to some conclusions about the ultimate values, um, uh, then you want to consider how you're going to get to those values. Um, so, it's perhaps at the level of public policy that you would be thinking about: Can we reach these values? You know, what are the basic judgments that most people in our community are going to think are important, uh, are they the ones about care and harm or uh, do they include a strong purity component as well? That might be relevant to the kinds of policies that you'd be able to succeed in implementing. Um, and I, I suppose I should add, and, and certainly some areas of applied ethics, because applied ethics does bring in some factual content. Uh, so some areas of applied ethics that might also be significant. But at the more foundational level of moral philosophy, um, I don't think it tells us what values we ought to hold. Um, it tells us something about the values that most people do hold to some, to some degree or other. Mm -hmm. But uh, do you think that if we're talking about how society functions and how to promote social cohesion, for example, because different people have these different uh, innate preferences or innate intuitions about morality that we should take seriously uh, the way they look at things and for example when it comes to questions regarding purity or sanctity uh, and uh, I mean one example would be uh, adult incest that perhaps some people just by being exposed to the idea get really uneasy uh, and they wouldn't really want for uh, for a society to allow for that kind of behavior J just trying to have a cohesive uh, and stable society that we should uh, take seriously at least to some extent 
those sorts of intuitions that people have? Well, having a, a cohesive and stable society is, is one value, but it's not the only value. And other values relate to people's freedoms of various kinds, including the freedom to obtain sexual satisfaction and to live out the, that sexual aspect of their lives in the way that is most fulfilling to them. Um, and and this, so you know these can be Im very important for some people. So you know if we had followed the uh, advice of do not go against people's purity values, um, then probably we would never have pushed for same-sex marriage, um, or even perhaps not even for the legalization of same-sex behaviour. Um, and clearly, um, particularly the, f the the latter of those um, was a great barrier to people living satisfactory lives, people who had preferences for, the, for the, their own sex, um, uh, you know, made them potentially criminals, made them liable to be blackmailed, um, all sorts of terrible things. So I think even if it produced some element of uh, less stability and cohesion, it was worthwhile um, decriminalizing same-sex activity, and I also think it was worthwhile producing marriage equality. Um, but there might be some cases where it's not worthwhile um, and perhaps uh, adult sibling incest is one such case because it's probably pretty rare that um, adult siblings want to have sex, um, even more rare that they would be likely to be prosecuted for it if they did. Um, so, you know, if, if a big push to decriminalize that in those jurisdictions in which it is a crime uh, were to really upset a lot of people in society and uh, cause political turmoil or something like that, maybe that wouldn't be worth it. Um, yeah, I think, I think you have to, basically I'm saying you, you, you need to pick your battles, you know, pick, pick your battles where they're really important, where the, the goals are enough for the damage that the war is likely to cause. And uh, there might be some cases where the, the goals are not important enough for the damage. Mm -hmm. uh, I was just wondering, uh, um, I mean, what would be the limits in terms of individual liberty when people are deciding how they should lead their lives and how they should establish relation, uh, consensual relationships with other people? Because, for example, just one example that comes to my mind is the one about uh, some people, particularly the ones that are polyamorous, wanting to push uh, for the legalization of polygamy in this case because uh, I've talked with some evolutionary psychologists that do work specifically on these and I mean the access of uh, per um, particularly young men to women because it seems that when young men, particularly the ones that live in more disfavorable conditions and don't have access to women, women in this case being put as sexual resources, then that could really destabilize society because young men really uh, prefer uh, r more risky behavior just to gain uh, just to gain a little bit more of social status very easily and try to have access to women so i was just wondering if for example the reason why nowadays in the more developed countries uh, we don't have legalized polygamy was because even at an unconscious level this was what worked best because it allowed for more people to have access to a sexual partner that if they were to be monopolized by uh, the richer guys or the guys with more status, for example, that, I mean, it in any way would be really problematic for the long-term stability of society. Um, yeah, those are interesting questions. Uh, I, I think that there are probably other reasons why today we might not favor polygamy, and that is that polygamy, um, you know, typically, in fact, you know, the, the term is, is suggesting uh, one man and several women, um, and I think that's what you're assuming in, in what you're talking about then. Um, and uh, that seems to suggest a 
lower status for women, um, that they only get sort of, you know, one fourth or whatever, however many wives you have, I guess, of, of the male's attention. Um, uh, and, uh, but it, d it could also have the problems that you mentioned too, that, that males who are less successful um, don't have any um, opportunities for finding a sexual partner and perhaps that leads to more risky behaviour. Uh, I suppose that there's a lot of information about polygamous societies. There have been many polygamous societies for, um, and, and some of them do seem to be very stable, I mean, in stable in the sense of lasting for many centuries. So I'm not sure if it's a question of about mm -hmm. stability or rather a question about uh, equality of the sexes and uh, equal status um, that might be one of the relevant factors here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's end the interview here, Dr. Singer. But just before we go, uh, are you working now in a new book or something that you would like for us to know? What I've been doing for the last few months is uh, not working on a new book, but updating my book, The Life You Can Save, which was published 10 years ago. Um, a lot of things have happened in the area of, of global poverty and also, of course, in the area of uh, altruism and philanthropy. Um, but more importantly, uh, the book gave rise to an organization called The Life You Can Save. And that organization, uh, run by uh, a volunteer called Charlie Bressler, who's really dedicating his life to, to working this organ organization for without any pay, um, had the idea that it would be worthwhile to try to get the rights back for the book so that we can put it online um, free of charge as an e-book and also as an audio book. Um, and I'm very pleased that that's going to be happening. Um, the audio book is actually going to be read by a number of celebrities, in including some of the actors from the TV show The Good Place, which has got a lot of ethics in it, um, like Kirsten Bell and Ted Danson and Mike Schur, the creator. Uh, Paul Simon of Simon and Garfunkel has also agreed to read a chapter and uh, a number of other uh, celebrities as well. So um, that will also be available for free. So I'm quite excited about the prospects of having a much wider readership for this because uh, so many people will be able to, to get access to it. Uh, so that's occupied me for the last few months. Um, after that, I do have uh, you know various other projects that I'm planning to work on, but uh, it's a little bit early to say which is going to be the, the next book after that. Okay. okay, so Dr. Singer, it was really a pleasure to have you on the show and to talk to you face to face. So thank you again for taking the time and for accepting the invitation. It's my pleasure, Ricardo. Thanks for your stimulating, challenging questions. It's been good to talk to you. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Hi there, thank you for coming to my channel and for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've been putting out regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. So to keep the channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. Uh, otherwise, I also have a PayPal and Subscribestar. And if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Perelga Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Chantel Gelinas, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Brian Ian Rivera, Lucas Stafiniak, Sergio Condriano, Iane Henninen, Ricardo Vladimiro, and Dr. Jerry Muller, Herbert Gintis, and Ruth Gervois, and also my three producers, Isar Webb, Rosie, and Jim Frank. Thank you for all.